Thanks. It's an honor to have you here and have this uh, conversation. You've just heard about uh, uh, Renuka's journey of um, 30 plus years. And uh, I thought uh, for the purpose of the, uh, this evening, we are going to break up her conversation into three parts. Uh, about her time at ICICI, about her time at multiples, and uh, also given the fact that she is, uh, as, was as she was described, a leading lady of the private equity uh, industry, just talk about what is happening in the industry and what uh, some of the trends are. So with that, uh, Renuka, maybe we can jump uh, straight into our conversation. Good evening. Very happy to be here. When Amit said he's going to break it up into th three parts, I thought he would say the last part is leg pulling. <laughs> I'm happy <laughs> that is not part of the agenda. Whatever you say, Amit, I've but always obeyed you in ICCI. It just that's continues. Your, yeah. You're hardly <laughs> generous, but uh, anyway, we'll uh, kind of uh, begin. You know, we heard about what you've got, your education, your time at ICICI. One of the things which I do recall from my time there is you go uh, study at Harvard, you do the advanced management program, and you come back and you tell Mr. Kamath that, look, uh, all this is very well, but you've kind of, I've been lending, I've been in the merchant banking division, I'm now heading the securitization, and uh, none of them is going to be of any interest to me going forward. I want a complete shift in what my roles and responsibilities in the bank are going to be. So walk us through what is it that led to the shift? What is it that you saw at Harvard during that time, which kind of came back and uh, led you to have this conversation with Mr. Kamath? Yeah. So I guess, uh, you know, if, if we believe in um, spirituality, then we believe in when the time comes, things happen, and you need a trigger. Uh, you know, I went to the U.S. for the very first time in 1993. And um, on the weekends, I did, it was a long trip. It was for over four months. And every weekend, I would get bored. So I decided that instead of getting bored, let me go and visit new cities. So I went to Boston. I looked at the Harvard Business School. I was taken in. I said, one day I will come back and study something. By then I was already a mother of two, so I knew I couldn't leave them and go on a two-year MBA program. And since that was hard-coded in my head, I waited for the right time, both from a family situation where I can park the children for three, three and a half months, and also ICSA should feel worthy to sponsor me because it's a very expensive program. So that happened in 99. And uh, when I sat in the plane, I mean, this is uh, absolute truth. I'm not making it up as a story. When I sat in the plane to go to the US from India, I said, A, I'm not going to be in touch with what's going on in India. And I'm going to come back as a different person. It, it was just a resolve, uh, uh, my own personal resolve, no, no trigger. And because I made that resolve, every course material, every study group discussion, every case study was too important to me. Otherwise, our mind, when you are already in the thick of a job, you are constantly thinking about what's the deal that's going on, what's the politics that's going on, what's going to happen to my promotion when I go back. I had no such worry. I was just completely soaked in by everything that was happening there. And uh, the other good fortune was, it was peak of internet time, 1999. And Harvard had done a whole new building, the MacArthur building, for this executive program. They had wired it with high bandwidth cable. Everything was being done on the internet. So that was also kind of very impactful. And then the case studies where you hear the story of the Starbucks and the Nike and everything, who all have gone through almost near-death experience before they came out of it and built world-class companies. That led me to really worship entrepreneurship. So it was a combination of all of this which kind of uh, really triggered that entrepreneurial streak in me. And I came back and told Mr. Kamath that none of the current businesses in ICSA need me. 
can I build e-commerce practice for, for ICICI? Or the other gap I saw there was private wealth management. He thought for less than 10 seconds, he said, do e-commerce, and that's how the journey began. Yeah. You were looking at some fairly interesting projects. There was a travel agency out there. There was a no, payment. No, those are the, uh, that's the crazy side of me. So, uh, you know, when someone says do X, right from my childhood, I have to do 10X. And sometimes I get reprimanded, sometimes I get appreciated. I really don't bother about it. So, Kamath told me that, uh, look, you do e-commerce, but you just build the e-commerce uh, intelligence. So, who are good technology vendors, what technology platforms we should. Don't run any of our channels because I want the businesses to own them, which is, of course, the right business decision. So I said, fine, fine, and neither of us knew what exactly I was going to do. But Kamath being Kamath, you know, he remembers everything, and it's, he's just amazing. So shortly, in a few days, we had a big group uh, executive meeting, and he said, hey, Renu, you wanted to do e-commerce, why don't you set up ICICI's intranet? So I said, Theek hai. I mean, I need a beginning, and I got this beginning. And I had done my Cisco case study, where Cis for Cisco, the biggest strategic competitive advantage was their internet. So I didn't look at it as, what a rubbish thing to do, what is there in internet. I said, how do I make internet a very powerful tool of transformation in ICICI, right? So I started, and then I saw, I went to a conference, saw Check Free. I said, why not ICICI build an equivalent of Check Free? So he came back and told Mr. Kamath, sir, we should build an equivalent of check free. So he said, I don't know what you will do, but how much money do you need? I said, I need about 15 crores. So he said, make a memo. So I made a memo and got started. And I knew that these initiatives cannot be housed inside a bank. RBI will not allow it. So I hired people as consultants of ICICI and said that let us start incubating these ventures. So the travel portal was one such thing. Uh, we also incubated India's first internet payment gateway. And then we created a equivalent of check free for India, compliant with the RBI guidelines in India. We don't have the ECH mechanism of America, and so on. So everything was a two-page memo, a two-minute decision, very limited capital. And within this, either you build a company or you hang yourself. The choice was mine. That's how I got started. And uh, after about 9 to 12 months, one day I told Mr. Kamath that uh, you should come and talk to my team. So he thought my team may be 10, 15 people, right? And then just before the meeting, where do I have to go? So it was the largest auditorium in ICICI building. He said, but why are you holding the meeting there? I said, there are 150 people. So he got his jaw dropped. And I know, having, having worked for him, exactly what would worry him. I said, sir, not a single person is your employee. They are all our advisors. You don't worry about it. None of them are your employees. So that's how the or entrepreneurship is what Mr. Kamath had uh, called it, uh, you know, at that time. So many. Some of them failed, some of them became super successes, uh, and that's how the journey began. Yeah. And then you kind of moved uh, to ICICI Ventures. So that also, I presume, just happened along the line when... Uh... No. Um, one, I think ICICI was would have been happy also to keep me a little bit away because I was a bit unmanageable. But uh, uh, equally, what had happened, it was a very interesting period. And I feel that uh, timing is so important in anything that you do. I mean, before this, I had a conversation with Vivek, and he was talking about how COVID helped, you know, in terms of uh, crystallizing your business model. So. ICICI from a financial institution was becoming a commercial bank. So it meant that all of their activities will now come squarely under the surveillance of Reserve Bank of India. And since a commercial bank is a deposit-taking institution from retail 
in retail deposit holders, there are tremendous restrictions on what you can do and what you cannot do. So RBI had said that as you are becoming a bank, all your investment activities have to be put in a separate entity and managed at arm's length. So they also needed to carve out many of their investments, incubation, like I say, Infotech, I say, one source, many things that I was doing and put it away and put a responsible person. So that helped. Secondly, all the senior leaders in ICICI saw that I am much more effective uh, when I'm left alone, when I'm left in an entrepreneurial space, rather than being asked to do a very rule-based business. So both this combined, they needed a responsible person to take over all the assets from the balance sheet and make the parent company balance sheet a pure play banking, combined with my own strengths, led me to uh, the job of ICSA Venture. And <laughs> to share an inside story now that it's such an old story, uh, the CEO, the then CEO of ICSA Venture would go and complain to the top management of ICICI every other day saying he's not able to make progress because Renuka was doing his work. Whereas I never went and complained. So they said, why not give that job to Renuka? <laughs> So actually, that began your whole journey into venture capital PE. So you built uh, <coughs> ICICI Ventures, as it was then called, from about a hundred million company to something which is two billion dollars. Yeah. So which was fairly large. I mean, it's very large even today. So at that time, it was uh, astronomical in size. And one day, you kind of just decided that I'm going to throw it all away and uh, let me. Yeah, no problem. No. You decide that you're going to throw it away and. Uh, going to reset things to zero. What was your thought process at that time? Yeah. <laughs> Some of my life is full of interesting stories. Um, so I scaled ICSA Venture and uh, scaling ICSA Venture in my business, it's about fiduciary fund management. Uh, so I used ICSA brand but the money was all third party. Mm -hmm. So when I took over ICC Venture as the CEO, it, was, it looked like almost an extension of ICC Treasury because I had about 500 crores of ICICI and about 200, 250 crores of third party. And I had agreed with Mr. Kamat that there is no point in running this as a separate company if all the money that I manage is your money then I might as well become part of Nachiket's group and sit there in the treasury. So being my stupid self, I went and told him that, uh, sir, if 75% is not third party money, it is not worth it. And he is a very, very smart leader. And if one of his subordinates is gladly putting the foot in the mouth, he quickly grabbed it. He said, yes, absolutely, Renu, you have to raise 75% third party, right? And then many things happened. Uh, the world capital markets collapsed because internet collapsed. Then September 11 happened. Uh, the rest of the world said Tata to an emerging country like India. They said, we don't want to put a single dollar in India. There was no capital. And I had already gone and stuck my neck out saying I'll raise 75% third party. So now I can't go and tell Mr. Kamath, sorry, reset my goal. So I had to knock on the doors of domestic institutions. I somehow put it together. It was her, it was a excruciating first three years. I was not sure whether I would survive at the end of that journey, but it happened because of tremendous hard work and perseverance. And then I walked down this journey by the time I came to 2009, 95% of the money that I was managing was third party money. And as the third party money kept increasing and ran into billions of dollars, these institutions started to ask responsible questions like, uh, you know, what's the guarantee that you will be here? How much of the economics do you and your team get? how much of the fees that we pay, you have the discretion to spend on hiring a good team and so on and so forth. Which clearly meant that I cannot be 
completely under the uh, hold of ICICI as a pure subsidiary. But if you look at all the other subsidiaries of ICICI, the insurance company, the general insurance company, the mutual fund, they were all riding on the franchise of ICICI. They were using their branches, they were using their uh, regulatory uh, status and so on. Whereas mine was a pure fiduciary fund management based on the skills of me and my team. So this conversation with ICICI did not find much favor with ICICI. And they wanted to keep it closer to themselves and yet wanted me to grow from two and a half billion to five billion. So it was like an unsolvable mathematical problem where you have to get a lot of foreign money to grow who then want great clarity, whereas ICICI wanted ICICI Venture to look exactly like them. So my choices were either stay in ICICI and shrink the business or move out. I mean, it was, you, I had hit my professional glass ceiling there. So I chose the latter. Uh, I'll just pause here. I think what is uh, noteworthy, of course, is the fact that you know, she returns from Harvard and starts off this whole business. She's uh, not quite 40. And by the time she's not quite 50, she's kind of gone through, or uh, actually much, much younger, uh, not quite 45. She's kind of gone through, built this huge business and decides to kind of embark on a journey on, uh, on her own. So that's really, really remarkable. So let's uh, give a round of applause to Renuka for this. No leg pulling. No leg pulling. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you spoke a lot about Mr. Kamat and uh, all of us who've been there in the financial sector talk about the fact that, you know, he's been a great leader, but not just him, but Mr. Vagul before. Uh, but also a number of, uh, large number of leaders that ICICI has spawned. Now, given the fact, and we'll kind of talk about leadership uh, a little while uh, in more detail, but can you just kind of think about what is it in ICICI that helps uh, or what is it in the culture that has created so many leaders out there? Yourself, of course, included. Thank you. So I think that uh, ICICI is, a, uh, is an institution which encourages innovation. So there is no idea that is shot down because it cannot be done in ICICI. Uh, so right from the time I joined ICC in 86, I used to be very impressed by how much this institution was integrated with many of the leading institutions around the world. And Mr. Bagul had inculcated in the institution that we will continuously learn from the developments in the Western markets. So people would travel, we would be sent on sponsored training programs, there would be joint ventures. There were very many ways of learning how fast the Western markets were progressing with financial products uh, and solutions. And so I think that is the speciality of ICICI. It invested in people without demanding any bond or any kind of restrictions, just sheer trust, sh just for the sheer pleasure of making their employees more capable professionals and constantly encouraging innovation and not punishing failure. So I have had so many failures, uh, you know, in my uh, journey in ICC. It's just that the number of things that I got right far outshined the number of failures. And everything, I've, every time I failed, I could get up and run again without any fear of punishment or, or setback, I think. So exposure to the global world, encouraging innovation and not punishing failure is, uh, I think, uh, the reason. So uh, let me kind of extend it to your uh, current business. So how many of these lessons or these cultural traits do you think are there in multiples today? And have you actively kind of uh, cultivated them or they just kind of are a part of your DNA, something which you've learned and now a part of your DNA, so you've uh, passed them on to the organization. So talk about the culture at multiples today. Yeah, and great. also over, maybe you can just talk about how it's changed over the years given the difference in scale from when you started to where you are today. Yeah. 
No, uh, I would say I've carried all that. I mean, it's very, very difficult to say what is ICSA and what is me because we have not been two different things. We have been two sides of the same coin, right? For me, ICSA was first, Renuka was next when I was there. So all of these are pretty much part of the person I am and uh, I've carried that on to uh, Ex the, the big difference is when we were very young professionals, uh, we were very fearful, the job was too dear, uh, you know, if you made a mistake and got kicked out, where else will you go was a big problem. Money was very important. But today's youngsters are very bold. They, are, and they definitely think that they know more than anybody else in the organization. So I don't have to work very hard to push people uh, you know, to challenge status quo and uh, think innovatively. So that is uh, completely part of the DNA with which Multiples was born. And the differentiated things we did was, so uh, I call myself a private equity firm. And when we invested early on in companies like India Energy Exchange or Delivery, everyone said, hey, are you behaving like a venture capital? Uh, you know, how do you invest in loss-making businesses? Uh, you know, how will you go and explain to your investors that these companies are burning money and they're going to be continuously diluting you and so on? None of these things deterred us. And today in our portfolio, we have, we are just so proud of our portfolio. We built companies like India Energy Exchange, which is only power infrastructure in the country, uh, delivery, Dream 11, ACO, the only direct-to-consumer insurance company, Licious, the direct-to-consumer food brand, NEO, which is again a fintech company but not on the lending side, Quantify, India's homegrown AIML company, which is a partner to Google uh, uh, globally, uh, MoEngage, which is a SaaS company, which is a marketing technology company. So our portfolio has these studded with these uh, stars. And every time we do a deal like this, we are criticized first, you know, as to, hey, are you behaving like a venture capitalist? I would say I'm not behaving like a venture capitalist because I don't, first of all, go in that early into a company. And secondly, I don't go with, an, with the notion that some of my companies will fail. We only pick companies that we know we can make them as category leaders. So that's how we have created a niche, uh, you know, for, uh, for ourselves. This requires getting your team to be prepared for tomorrow. So as a rule, I don't invest behind discovered stories. I, you know, the rule in multiples is that you will discover a category for the world and not invest behind proven stories. And the second thing is how do you do entrepreneur engagement? when both of you are navigating through a lot of ambiguity about the market, about the customers, about pricing, about copycats, about how the competitive landscape will develop, how much to burn, how fast to grow, are you building a moat or are you just burning money? So there are so many questions that are there in front of you and how do you become a genuine business partner for your entrepreneur so that there is complete trust? And once there is complete trust, you, the entrepreneur gets a lot of confidence that he has a totally aligned partner in multiples who is also an investor. And then together you find the answers that you think are appropriate for you at that point of time. And uh, this model has given us repeated success and that's how multiples is really differentiated itself in the marketplace so this power to be different uh, to be innovative to be entrepreneurial in your investing business is the dna i feel which is which has come from our icsa experience which has been kind of passed on to multiples yeah. so there are a lot of threads in uh, that answer and maybe i can pick up on a few of them. So the first is, you know, you listed out some of the companies you've invested in and uh, they're doing re uh, reasonably well. 
So how do you kind of go through it? Do you meet someone and say, okay, this is who I'm going to invest in? Do you have go through the numbers uh, over a three, four, five, six a month period? Uh, does the team get involved or is it just you who kind of spends time, wines and dines, see if there's a cultural fit? How does that whole process work? So will you just uh, uh, expand a little bit on that? Yeah, sure. So, uh, no, wining and dining doesn't take us very far. <laughs> it just happens because we have to feed ourselves. So, um, I'll say that uh, first we are organized as sectors. So, financial services is an important sector. Consumer is an important sector. B2B enterprise technology is an important sector. So, my sector leads along with their teams have a uh, hypothesis, an a priori hypothesis about this is where I want to invest. So, I want to invest in a marketing technology company is a hypothesis we had even before we started the fund based on pure research of what's going on in the market, what kind of platforms are likely to have maximum tailwind in the next three to four years. Then it's a question of finding the right company. And uh, there it is, again, going deep into how, how have you thought about the market, size of the market opportunity, how have you positioned yourself. In Mo Engage's case, how have you thought about the technology uh, that you are building, verifying with real experts. So we got the founder of Global Logic to vet the technology that Mo Engage team had built to see that if their customers were 10x the current size, will the technology really hold up? So you get into a very, very detailed evaluation of the business model. Can Do you have pricing power? Do you have the ability to build a moat? Or are you just walking into a more and more competitive space, in which case you are only going to see price cuts? Uh, and then we get into uh, the psychographic of the entrepreneur, which for me is 80% of the reason why you invest in a company. So are you mindseted to build a sustainable company? Uh, so how do you deal with professionals? How do you deal with your investor partner? Do you even have a sense of partnership? Uh, how do you think about capital? How do you think about governance? How do you how do you rate this person on strategic agility? So over time, we have created very, very thorough frameworks so that there is no difference between one leader evaluating and another leader evaluating. And uh, one of the biggest, uh, uh, I would say, risks in, in our business is the charisma of the entrepreneur. So some of the entrepreneurs are very, very compelling storytellers. Uh, they could also come with a big brand name and one could get easily carried away. Uh, so to build a sustainable business, unless the entrepreneur is in balance and on all of these faculties, sooner or later, you will hit a, hit a iceberg. So we evaluate that thoroughly by everything we observe when we go to our clients' premises from how they have kept the toilets to how do they deal with their chai walas to what is the upkeep of the office because everything tells a story. And uh, whether there is a fit between how we would like to see, it's not that we want to see a particular type of office. All offices are customized to the businesses that they are in. But the value system that you bring to your business is shown in every little piece of what you do, we, we observe that and then come to a conclusion on is this a multiples entrepreneur, you know. So there is a fit of the entrepreneur to the business that he is doing and there is a fit of the entrepreneur to how he deals with all the other stakeholders and then there is a fit of the entrepreneur to multiples because Multiples cannot be just a financial investor. We are a business partner. So if the person just wants our money, then we are the wrong partner for them. Once we pass all of the, this test, then we go forward and make the commitment. So it's a very involved exercise. It takes several months. 
yet you are in a very competitive market. So doing that dance is, uh, is the toughest part of our business. Yeah. So there is, uh, of course, I've heard the story of uh, Love at First Sight when you kind yeah. of met with uh, Dream Eleven yeah. and uh, instantly decided to invest with them. Uh, how, how did that go? What happened? Why, how did you go and meet, the, meet up with them? So that was an interesting story and that's where again I would say the multiples flexibility and openness to new opportunities really kicked in. So, so before that I'd like to say that you know we all hear about funds which are uh, unicorns but uh, Dream 11 is what is described as a dragon. A dragon is where a single investment returns the full fund uh, corpus. And uh, while there are a lot of unicorns around, uh, at least we've heard of a lot of them till last year, this year there are few, fewer of them. But dragons are even rarer. So this was a dragon which was uh, uh, there in their portfolio and uh, talk about that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Harsh Jain's father is known to me from ICSA days and so Mr. Anand Jain called me and he said, Renu, as you know, I'm a very old world man, I'm a hardcore a brick and mortar guy, he's an infrastructure guy, person. Whereas my son is doing something on the tech side. So will you just meet him and guide him? And you also tell me whether he is on the right path. So I also took it at face value. I said, yes, yes, Ananji, I will meet him. And then I told my assistant that please set up a time and Harsh lands up in my office. So I had not made any arrangements. In the sense, I had not called any of my colleagues. I had not read up about his business, I said, I have to only meet him and guide him. And then I started asking him, what, what do you do and all of that. And within 10 minutes, I felt that this guy was on to something very big. Uh, because cricket is a religion for us. And what he was building was, you know, active engagement on the sports. And the way Harsh described it, and his personality as well, you know, the calm, collected, well thought out, it all came out, you know, so instantaneously. Then I said, uh, this is fantastic, Harsh, pause, I'll call my team because I don't want you to repeat the whole thing. So I called my tech in, uh, lead and one more person and I said, let's listen to the story together. And uh, he said it. and. See, given my 25 years of experience in just the investing industry, 35 years in the market, some questions about any business comes quite obviously because of those experiences. I, I would ask him those questions as to how would you deal with this risk, that risk. He had very, very collected, mature response to all of those questions. Uh, so the meeting ended and I said, no, this looks very interesting, Harsh. If you don't mind, can we take a look at it for investment ourselves? So he said, oh, I never expected that. He said, that would be fantastic. Uh, then he left and then my colleague said, uh, okay, Renu, you, you carry on. You have given a lot of time. I'll call him tomorrow and politely decline. I said, why would you decline? So he said, no, this is not a multiples deal. I said, who told you? There is nothing called a multiples deal and not a multiples deal. Let us go ahead and evaluate this. And um, so we said we have two big questions as far as uh, Dream 11 is concerned. One is, so at that time, Harsh used to give 50 rupees for everybody who comes and pays on the pla plays on the platform. So if he stops this blood supply, will the customers walk away? Are people coming and playing here because you get 50 rupees? And if you introduce one more person, you get another 50 rupees. So you can put 100 rupees and play on this platform. So we had to evaluate what is the strength of this product. Will it stand on its own legs? Or it is standing only because of blood supply from the company? The second was this whole legal risk of is this gambling or is this a game of skill? So we said that a very routine market uh, research is not going to help us because you're talking about the potential of a product which is just developing. You know, it is not 
uh, it's not a soap that you can give it to somebody and say use it for seven days is your skin's not getting dry so you need a very customized market research for this otherwise you ask the wrong questions and you're going to come with the wrong uh, understanding so i called rama to office and i said this is the opportunity rama prima facie how do you feel about it she also said my god this is very exciting and i'm so glad you called me we sat down and created what should be the questions and how would we administer this market research so that we really understand the market and on the legal side i called zia and i called one more leading lawyer and i said this is a case and i want your personal involvement and personal assurance that in the court this will come out as a game of skill and then it went on and it took us 3 4 months to finally cross all of these hurdles and it was uh, just amazing interacting with her you know every in in one of the meetings i had my very very tough questions for him and and i was i took the liberty because there's so much age difference and with younger entrepreneurs you can ask some of these very very tough questions he answered them beautifully then i said harsh would you mind writing all of this and sending it to me because when you write you will have even greater clarity about what you would do when you are facing some of these completely unexpected uh, situations from the market overnight he wrote and sent it to me so i always do these funny small tricks to really understand the sincerity of the entrepreneur or any other aspect about the entrepreneur that say if he had not done it or if he had asked his assistant to do it or if he had said no i've told you all the answers so what is there for me to write the whole thing you know what kind of a person you are dealing with right so so many confirmations along the way that this is indeed an investment that multiple should bold, boldly pursue but after that the number of people who have told me how did you have the guts to do dream 11 or i would have a whole bunch of people who would say if only my investment committee could understand all those people sitting far away in new york and hong kong don't understand india so you would have people on both sides you know people who are very jealous of you that you could do it or people who said why are you such a schizophrenic you know how did you have the confidence to do dream 11 so that's the beauty of our business as well on the day you're going in you really don't know whether you're going to be in the money or uh, you're going to come out not so successful and i think what is also interesting is you've kind of broken down the barriers there's nothing like private equity venture capital early stage late stage you were kind of able to transcend all these investment styles so uh, within the, the company so the time we invested in dream 11 there were 2 million users so i wouldn't have gone when there are 50 users for instance right so 2 million is a significant uh, user base and in 4 years it became 150 million that's another matter but so there were enough user base the technology had already developed uh, you had paying users and non paying users and you had a plan so there was enough that could be verified yeah uh, let me ask you about another uh, investment which has been there and that's something which you've run with in your days at icici ventures as also multiples which is pvr uh, that's a been a stand out investment for you what is it that you saw in the company and what is it that you saw in ajay bijli that you kind of invested and then repeatedly uh, continued to back him including uh, when the pandemic hit when you uh, supported him through uh, injecting some capital at that stage so is it the business is it uh, the promoter is it your gut feel about it uh, is it that the team's convi conviction that yes this is an idea and story which is worth backing talk about that so my very first investment in pvr was at the time when the retail revolution was happening in the country uh, malls were just coming up and uh, indian patrons were getting used to the concept of multiplex and my big worry at that time used to be will someone pay 75 rupees for a ticket when you could walk into a regular theater and pay 15 rupees or 20 rupees right 
uh, and will pay people pay those 20 rupees for popcorn today people pay 1000 rupees for a movie ticket so i had to verify that but what caught our attention one of course this macro that malls are getting developed and if you back the leader at that time, you know, in terms of the brand, in terms of the customer experience, although there were only 11 screens, the PVR patrons were die-hard PVR patrons, right? I mean, the difference was not a small one. Uh, and if you back the, therefore, the guy who has the ability to build the right customer experience and capture the best malls in the country, you can build a highly differentiated business. That was the hypothesis. And what I saw in Ajay Bijli were two things. One was that uh, uh, he was very clear that I am in the business of wowing my customers. And my customers come to me because they want to forget their world and their problem for the three hours. And they want to be transported into a world of fantasy. Therefore, from the time they enter my theater, they have to drop all their worries. So he would pay attention to every micro inch of a PVR premise, the smell, you know, where should we have the candy bar? What should be the smell when you enter? Because all your senses drive your experience. You know, it is just not what you see. So what should be the, from the acoustics to the colors, to the opulence, where do I use marble? Where will I use tiles? You, nobody will believe the amount of discussion we would have on can some portion of the marble be converted into tiles to save costs because finally as an investor we have to make the money. Every piece of artifact, every piece of lighting and acoustics and the ki kind of screen and the size of the screen, the quality of chair, the price of the chair would be big discussions way back in 2002-2003 and it would be an emotional uh, kind of moment when Ajay would sometimes be on the verge of tears as to how do I explain to you that if I do something else, I will compromise the customer experience, you know. Where else can we save the cost and yet deliver the numbers without uh, compromising the customer experience. So that for a customer company, that acute focus on what is the value I'm giving my customers unfailingly. Every time you come into my cinemas, it has to be the same, was something that, uh, uh, that I thought would make a difference. And that was a big call. Besides the macro that many malls were coming in and that was a good time to invest. The second was, you know, I am a person uh, who believe only in partnerships. So I don't have misaligned relationship with any of my investing companies. In ICC Ventures, same is true in multiples as well. So it's not enough for me to decide that I want to be partner with you. You have to feel that, you know, I'm a partner and not just a financial investor. So as one of the references Ajay took us to Melbourne to meet is estranged partner, uh, Richard Kirby, who had, uh, with whom PVR, PVR is Priya Village Roadshow. And Village Roadshow is an Australian company which had partnered with uh, Priya Cinemas. And big, when there was a global crisis, they had lost a lot of money and they decided to retract from the rest of the world and consolidate only in Australia. That's how they split. So he took me to meet somebody who has walked away from his business. That gave me the confidence that this guy is capable of building genuine trusted partnership. Otherwise, he would have kept Mr. Kirby far away from me, right? So these two things were important factors besides the economics and all of that stuff. And we could, uh, you know, the, the journey of last 20 years has been unbelievable, right? From 11 screens to we are now at 1,500 screens from a company which was valued at 60 crores by me in 2002, uh, we are at 12,000 crores now. And, uh, uh, you know, from just a Delhi-based company, we are truly a pan-India company. Our uh, southern cinemas contribute more than 40% of our revenues. And the kind of consolidation that we have done 
with people, everyone who thought, we thought DT cinemas will gobble us up. You know, we thought uh, Inox will gobble us up. So at every stage going through those very, very existential challenges, uh, when Mr. Anil Ambani bought Ad Labs, uh, someone from Anil Ambani's office called me and he said, Hey Renu, what are you fussing around with PBR? You're going to die anyway. Why don't you just sell the company to me? This was the precise call that I got. I said, yes, if you desire so, I will give the company to you. And we said that, uh, you know, we are not going to get bogged down by this competition. So building these companies is not just about making smart choices, but it is about being with those entrepreneurs in those very critical ICU moments and showing the strength and support uh, whether it is putting more money or bringing the right alliance or giving the right counsel or getting the right money from the capital markets, taking the company at the right time, bringing a currency, educating sometimes the entrepreneur to say, it's okay for you to dilute. So from Mr. Ajay Bijli's stake used to be 49%. Now he is 15%, right? So it's not a joke for an entrepreneur to dilute so much. So... Uh, and how do you give confidence to say that count my shares as your shares, right? And let's go out and build the most valuable, the least vulnerable company. Uh, so it is, that is where the partnership really kicks in. So one of my questions um, to you would have been that look, when you, given the fact that the industry is very competitive and everyone's willing to give money and maybe a little bit more, how is it that you've been able to you know, finance so many great businesses. I think we've got all the answers uh, through some of the stories which you've narrated. Let me kind of jump from this to just uh, the fact that you've observed the industry now for about close to 20 years. When you started, uh, it was more venture than private equity. Yeah. None of the big names which uh, dominate the global landscape, whether it is KKR or Carlyle or Apollo or uh, uh, a, uh, any of them, were Blackstone, were there. How is the industry, what, how do you see the change in the industry from then to now? And what is the impact some of these global players have had uh, on India? Is there, are they a force for good or are they kind of uh, just replicating the uh, global model or American model into India without really understanding the uh, rea Indian realities? No, I think they have definitely been a force for good. So the biggest, there are two big changes I'd like to articulate. One is just the sheer size. So when I started out in late 90s, we would barely receive less than half a billion dollar as an industry into the country from abroad. Domestic capital, there is no domestic capital. So that was all the capital that the industry had. To in its peak in 2021, we got $60 billion. On an average, we get $40 to $50 billion. So in 20 years, from less than half a billion dollar to a $50 billion is a big jump of capital. And as you correctly said, Amit, you know, 20 years back, it was just early stage venture capital and then capital markets. But today, the whole value chain is a very fully developed and evolved value chain from angel investing, to seed stage investing, to series A investing, to series B, C, D, which can be, you know, anybody who is a VC or a PE, to late stage PE, to pre-IPO funding. So you have the full value chain. So that has made exits at every stage a reality. So you're not stuck with your assets. The Product itself is a solution product. So it solves for many problems. I need capital is only one problem, but people think that our industry is only about solving for I need risk capital. There are many, many other problems we solve. Sometimes partners fight and one partner wants to consolidate, you know, you, you resolve that. Sometimes families, you know, there are 70 owners for a particular company and just one family wants to consolidate, we solve for that. Sometimes, like the deal that we did, buying uh, the animal health business from Zydus Cadilla, over time, it is a very, very large human pharma company, 
and when pankaj patel was transferring the business to his son he said i am interested only in human pharma i don't want to do animal pharma so we could take away the animal pharma business from him demergers you know again in terms of benchmarking valuation like in arvind where we invested behind the fashion company and separated out a value creating engine which was sitting inside a traditional uh, uh, textile company then all of these revolutions that have happened disruptive business models around digital disruption technology companies so those are squarely in the bracket of new business models disruptive business models where you are backing first generation entrepreneur to go out and build something completely new we are a solution so the way to think about our industry is that we are a solution capital and uh, i think there is much much better understanding of that today and earlier people would spend a lot of time talking about our clauses of drag along tag along everything seemed uh, you know very punishing for the entrepreneur but today people accept all of those and they know that those are for really bad days and uh, when you are dealing with third party money it is unavoidable so i think there is a massive change and today we can call ourselves an industry given the number of participants we have more than 10000 professionals in this industry with more than 1000 funds who are registered with sebi who are operating so it's a sea change uh, i would say in the last uh, 20 years and companies like blackstone and others coming into the country has really helped in buying very large companies creating that whole buyout market bringing institutional capital into real estate which is otherwise an industry which only survived on personal borrowings at very very high cost so the way i see the future is that uh, clearly the ownership is going to move from the hands of individuals and families to institutional ownership and our industry will be the catalyst for that that's a uh that's uh, i don't know how we are for time but that's a good place to end uh, the conversation with uh, renu here but Thank you. Uh, if we kind of uh, but before i let you go maybe the audience has uh, some questions it's they've been listening to you with rapt attention hi renu ka hi uh, it's always interesting to hear you talk about your dealings with entrepreneurs and promoters and you think about it very differently from anyone we work with uh, in the private equity industry many promoters are often a little anxious working with multiples or with you because you you can be quite tough when there are uh, differences of uh, of views so tell us about difficult situations you have faced with uh, promoters or entrepreneurs and what you learn from them yeah So I had my most uh, difficult situation with my investment in ICICI Venture and Subiksha. Uh, you know, coming from a very simple background myself, where there is a lot of emphasis placed on, you know, getting good qualification and so on. There are some implicit assumptions you make that if someone has gone to IIT or someone has gone to IIM or you know, if someone is kind of formally educated. comes from a very middle class background has a very simple lifestyle uh, you know that you know that it must be a safe place to be and uh, you know what i experienced there was something i didn't experience that suddenly money will vanish from the company suddenly there will be massive misrepresentation of numbers literally overnight and uh, and when it got to a point that i had no choice but to call out uh, because it is also very difficult to call out very early right i mean you don't suspect uh, your spouse if he is coming late one day home saying that no no you must be having an affair right nobody does that so in professional life as well you know you can't suspect based on just one or two circumstances because you're dealing with a very large company there are so many stakeholders there and you keep looking for confirmations and i hope i am not doing an injustice by calling out wrong or calling out 
at an inopportune time. So when I finally said, so he sent me a balance sheet and uh, it showed 600 crores of inventory. And everyone in the market has been calling me and saying, so Biksha shelves are empty. So I said, how can you have 600 crores inventory if as a retail company you're not going to keep it in the warehouse? So I asked him for addresses of about 80 stores and warehouses across the country. He said, why do you need it? I said, I'm sending my people. So he got very nervous. I mean, sometimes you have to just do crazy things. So like on one Saturday, Sunday, I had my entire team across the country because I didn't want to rely on any third party vendor. And they all came back and said, there is nothing, right? So then I called an emergency board meeting and said that this is not on. And we wrote to SFIO. So he went on TV and said that, uh, please don't ask me anything about my business because Renuka is running it. And why? Because ICC Venture had a very strict document with him because that's part of our business. So you do, uh, uh, you know, face those kind of uh, completely unexpected challenges. And what was the mistake I did? Trust. Just trusted him blindly because he was a IIT scholar, I am gold medalist, middle class guy who would come in chapels, travel in economy class, never stay in a hotel because he, say, he would say, I'm running a low cost store. How can I add up expenses in the company? So there are so many things that kind of clouded your brain. Whereas, uh, you know, so what really happened was very different. So what I learned from there was that uh, simple thing of trust, but verify. So back end has to be put ahead of front end. So this used to be our conversation. You want me to open stores or should I fix my back end, right? So as I was learning, I would have got confused. Today, if somebody asked me, bloody well back end. I don't care if you don't open a single store, if you don't know what you have stocked where and how, what is the aging of your inventory and how much you owe whom and how much you spend in every store, right? So, so I mean, somebody can turn around and say how stupid, but sometimes in our business we do. I mean, we, we become so compassionate uh, with our entrepreneurs. We want to be trusting them. We know what kind of competition they are facing. We know how hard they have to run. We know that a day has only 24 hours. We know how difficult it is to hire, you know, good top-notch talent. So you become little uh, empathetic and then you can have complete muck on my face. It is just the blessings that I am around today as a professional that, or, you know, Koram has found me uh, appropriate to come and talk here. You know, it's, it's a hairline. I mean, I've had such a miserable experience, I can't put it in words. So now, I, when I built multiples, I first built my backend. I have, sometimes people will laugh at the number of people I have in my fitness team, as I call it, uh, relative to my investment team. Good evening. Uh, how do you... Today, there are probably about 100, 120 unicorns in India. A lot of them are not making revenue. How do you sort of look at certain unicorns and invest in them where they have no revenues and some of them, I mean, I, I assume multiples would have, most of the unicorns would have reasonable revenues. How do you sort of split between the two and how do you sort of avoid the pitfalls of many of these larger VC funds which have also sort of got a few yeah. blowouts in the recent times? I mean. News has been full of blowouts recently and it's it's been quite scary in the VC world. Yeah. So one is, uh, you know, when you evaluate these uh, new business models, you have to really get to the depth of what is the problem you're solving for, you know. So if you look at delivery, it be, at the time I invested, first they were solving for just e-commerce delivery. And in e-commerce delivery, the biggest problem was the cash. The sale really happened in your house. Whereas up until then the sale happened somewhere else and logistics companies were simply carrying a document or a good. Whereas in e-commerce the sale happened at home and you collected the cash and then you had to put it through a reverse logistics of carrying the cash back. 
that's how this company started. So they were solving for a real problem. And then they saw that the whole space of deploying technology, giving predictive solutions to companies is a very big open space in logistics because most of the logistics companies are family run, terribly under invested, no technology, no predictability and which was really hampering the economy. And we supported Sahil in putting all of those infrastructures. So the most important thing to solve for is, you know, what is a real problem that you are solving for the customer? And is that a sustainable business? And when you get carried away by the fad, when you get carried away and say that, hey, I need to have a cosmetic company in my portfolio. I need to have a, uh, you know, plant-based, uh, uh, you know, cosmetics in my portfolio. Then you make all of these mistakes. And then the irresponsibility in our industry happened when too much money came into people who didn't have to really account for it, right? So, uh, and when those things happen, we are mature enough to just get on the footpath and allow the traffic to go. And then when more sobriety comes back into the market, get back. Nothing is, uh, nothing is running away. So this unicornism, while it was very good to kind of give a small word, easy to understand and inspire a lot of entrepreneurs, did also a lot of damage because most entrepreneurs thought that how quickly I become a unicorn is the definition of success. Uh, at least we tell our entrepreneurs that you are as dear and important to us even if you are not a unicorn. Right? Unicorn is not a goalpost to chase. But have you solved a real customer problem? Are you able to make profit in that? Uh, and are you able to hold your business for the next 20 years is the real success. Yeah. There's a question on this side. Yeah, good evening, ma'am. Uh, I think knowing about your background, you come from an era where businesses have been built without access to so much of external capital and they've become large. So today having this access is definitely a good thing, but is it becoming a good to have or a must to have? What is that? Access to such amount of capital compared to an era where companies have also done well uh, without such uh, access to external capital? No, I definitely think it is good to have because, uh, you know, not every company can be built on very tight bootstrap. cash boot, bootstrap, uh, bootstrap model. So, as long as that cash is being used responsibly to, to either build a very powerful network or to build a strong moat in your business, it is definitely a very strong positive. But simply burning it without any idea about is the market capable of supporting my burn will be foolish. Oh, one more question. The last question of the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renuka, for doing this. And I mean, uh, appreciate it. Um, um, the last question, Renuka, to you um, before we wrap up is, you've invested through various cycles over the last couple of decades. Uh, you've raised capital through various cycles. Um, if you could just share some uh, thoughts on how you see the perception of capital or your uh, limited partners outside, how they're looking at India today. Is it changed? Uh, or is it just another cycle? Uh, or is this, uh, is this a new structural era for, for India? And uh, I'd be keen to get your thoughts on, yeah. on that. So it's a, uh, raising capital is extremely challenging. I mean, one is India has to be good. Uh, India's story has to be strong. People should have conviction in the economy, uh, in the stability of markets, uh, the growth, and so on. Beyond that, your own performance has to be very good. That people will say, okay, India will do well, but multiples will do well as well, that they have strong track record. While these two are obvious, we face very funny problems. So, if you look at global institutional investors, who are the real deep-pocketed ones, they have very defined percentage allocation. So, if I have 100 rupees, 30 rupees will be in public markets, 30 rupees will be in private markets, you know, balance, let's say, 40 rupees will be in real estate, whatever it may be. Now, when public market valuations fall, Private markets don't fall necessarily in the same speed. 
So currently what we are going through is public markets have fallen, private markets haven't fallen. So in their portfolio, there is imbalance. So they will say, I cannot allocate more to, uh, you know, private markets at this point of time. And then when you have, so now interest rates have gone up in the US. So they are, a lot of money has gone back saying, hey, when, if I'm getting such fantastic dollar returns for taking such little risks and liquidity, no liquidity problem, why should I put away, put my money in far away markets like India? So you face that. Then the third problem is, hey, US valuations have corrected so much, but Indian valuations have not corrected that much, so why should I give money to India? Hey, China still is cheaper than India. You know, the problems of China are the things of the past. So why should I buy the same pharma company in India at three times the valuation that I'll pay in China? So why should I put money in India? So our problems are not restricted to only India shining or not shining or is the manager good or bad. There are so many other considerations that uh, it is fundraising is still pulling your teeth. So, <laughs> yeah. but the good news is that domestic market is opening up and domestic wealthy individuals are getting comfortable with this asset class. So if uh, any of you are ready with your check, you know where to send it, yeah. right? <laughs> hey, thank thank you. you all thank yeah, you very for giving much, me Renuka. this opportunity. No, no, thank you very much. It's really been an honor to speak to you and a real pleasure to speak to you.